This is an overview to Chapter 7b, the Paired Samples T-Test. We'll approach this topic with the following subtopics. Number one, we will have an example problem. Number two, we'll go over key components of the Paired Samples T-Test. Number three, we'll define what pairs are. And number four, we'll determine what test is appropriate. Consider this situation. Imagine that there are middle schools in a certain district with a lot of bullying incidents, and these are causing problems. It's a bad situation. Children are leaving. Families are relocating. A school counselor had an idea. She thought the schools could seek alliance with a few of the lead bullies, nominating them to join a leader's lead program because of their recognized leadership skills. The main responsibility of this group would be defending the victims of bullying. If these leaders, who were previously acting as bullies, changed their focus from bullying to defending, other bullies might follow. So the question is this, would this initiative reduce bullying, and how could we find out? So how can we determine if the initiative is effective? One idea is we could compare the average number of bullying incidents in schools with a leader's lead intervention to the average number of bullying incidents in typical schools. Maybe that idea sounds familiar to you from our last chapter. But we'll run into some problems. First of all, all the schools are very different. Um, some schools might have had a lot more bullying beforehand than other schools, and we don't want to compare those incidents straight up. And secondly, no such data have been collected. We don't have data, we don't have that information. So a better idea is to compare the change in the number of bullying incidents before and after the leader's lead program is not implemented. It's better because it relies on change from before to after the intervention in each school so it takes into account the differences between schools. So you're comparing each school with itself instead of each school with other schools. And so it allows schools to collect their own data and keep track of their, um, their own bullying incidents. And so you might have recognized that this top example, comparing the number of bullying incidents to typical schools or schools in general is a one sample t-test. And what we're doing here with these comparing a school to itself is called the paired samples t-test. So a little bit of a comparison. The biggest difference in these two tests, your book presents them in one chapter because they're so similar, is that in the one sample t-test, we use scores from a sample of individuals to represent population one. And in the paired samples t-test, we use different scores from a sample of paired individuals to represent population one. You'll see that the comparison distribution idea is just the same. We're comparing population one to a comparison distribution with a known mean and unknown standard deviation in both cases. We have a lot of different names for the paired samples t-test. It's sometimes called the dependent samples t-test. I think that's the name of the chapter in your book. The matched pairs t-test, the paired samples t-test, the repeated measures t-test, the t-test for dependent means, the t-test for related samples. All of these are names for the paired samples t-test. <clears throat> and we're just going to call it the paired samples t-test. Um, so it just uses different scores or change scores from individuals that are systematically related. So let's look at what this means. So what is meant by related samples or samples that are systematically related? So we have three types of related samples. The first is repeated measures, calculating different scores for individuals measured at two different points in time, such as taking before after scores, or measuring cortisol levels for a single person while that person is asleep and then again while they're awake. 
and doing this for a number of people. And we'll look at this again on the next slide. The second is natural pairs. In this case, we might have finding different scores for pairs of individuals that are related naturally in some way, like twins, twin siblings or mother-daughter pairs, just general sibling pairs, husband-wife. These are natural relationships, best friends, and that's what we mean by natural pairs. Thirdly, matched pairs. And so we'd be calculating different scores from pairs of individuals that we match on a key variable, like matching students from one school with students from another school based on their class ranking. Let's look at each of these a little more. So in pairing one, we're talking about repeated measures and we're using the example of word recall before and after sleep. And you can see here that we have 10 individuals and each individual has a before score, word recall before sleep, and an after score, words recalled after sleep. And we will be calculating a difference, but we're not going to do that right now. So as not to distract ourselves with math when we're thinking about the situation. So here it is again. We have um, Shauna, Frank, Sam, and Kenya, and each one took a word test. Then each of them got some sleep, and then the same group of individuals took another word test. And so same individuals, two data points, and this is why these are pairs. Each person is compared with him or herself. The second pairing we described are natural pairs. And in this example, the natural pairs are husband and wife. And you can see that these aren't the same individuals anymore. We have Shane married to Shauna, Frank married to Fanny, Sam married to Sophie, Curtis married to Kenya. And so we have 10 couples. We only have four couples listed here, but we have 10 couples in our sample and we have a score for the husband and a score for the wife. So we don't have two scores per individual. So these we're considering as a pair and we do the very same thing. We'd calculate a different score, subtract the husband's score from the wife's score to find out if there's a difference in marital satisfaction between these husbands and wives. Thirdly, we talked about matched pairs. And in this case, this is often used in schools where we have complicated situations. So let's imagine that we're comparing motivation in runners from school A that has some sort of an incentive program and school B that has no incentive. But we don't wanna just compare the average scores of the runners. We think we should compare them according to how well they do in a particular race. And so we take the first place runner at Carn School and compare that person with the first place runner at Oak School. So here we have the number one at Carn School, um, Chanel, compared with Sharon, the number one at Oak School. Now, next we match up the numbers second place runners. And so we have the at Carn School, the number two runner is Frida. At Oak School, the number two runner is Franny. And we continue on, comparing Sasha with Sophie, the third place runners, and Coletta with Kanya, the fourth place runners, and so on. And we measure motivation in each runner. And here we have pairs that are dependent on each other. What they have in common, each pairing is their ranking. And then we'll calculate the difference scores. We'll subtract one from the other we'll have the different scores and then we'll be able to know whether uh, the incentive program maybe is effective. So those are the three examples of the kinds of pairings that we work with in a paired samples t-test. So back to our bullying example, the research question is, and we're gonna go through the whole example here and just finish it through, but we're gonna do it kind of quick because we'll have more examples later. So the research question going all the way down to the second paragraph here, does bullying decrease significantly after popular school leaders are persuaded to defend the victims in four different schools? And we'll use significance level of alpha is 0.05. So we'll have Chinli High, 
window rack high to a city high ship rack high i don't even think those are the names of the schools in those communities but i guess i put them in here and now we have their number of bullying incidents before this leader's lead intervention and after the intervention and so we'll begin with step one parse the problem and the question just so we see it again is does bullying decrease after popular school leaders are persuaded to defend the victims in four schools so it's not quite as tidy a problem as some of what we worked with before you'll notice some differences in the way we parse this problem and we'll discuss these differences later um, when we talk about the differences so population one is schools in which the leaders lead intervention took place Population two is schools with no intervention or change. So um, this seems a little tricky because we're going to have two two. So the last five steps are here. It's just the same as before. Um, so in step two, we describe the comparison distribution. And in the paired samples t-test, for reasons we'll talk about later, 
the center of the distribution mu is always going to be zero. We're just assuming that this, what we're comparing our schools that had the intervention to are schools without the intervention. And if they didn't have the intervention, we assume the mean difference is zero. There is no difference before and after. The shape is the T distribution normal. We already have spread calculated earlier. Uh, the cutoff point, we determine exactly the same way using degrees of freedom. We find it's minus 2.35 and have it marked there. The sample t-score, we can calculate the same way. Sample mean minus population mean divided by spread. Here we have negative nine minus that zero divided by spread, and we get a t-score of minus 2.2983. And we mark that up in our chart. That's exactly the same way, the fail region in the center, the t-score, the t-score associated with alpha, and we decide and conclude. Our decision in this case is to fail to reject the null hypothesis. We can see the sample score here in the fail region, and we conclude that bullying levels after the intervention will be lower than before the intervention. And we mark our statistic t with a little degrees of freedom now in the subtext equals minus 2.29 and it's not significant ns. So you might be wondering then what statistical test is appropriate? So this is a chart that will be helpful to you and it looks at comparing the z-test, the one sample t-test and the paired samples t-test. So population one, or the sample, is one sample of individuals with one score each in the z-test, and it's the same in the one sample t-test, one sample of individuals with one score each. In the paired samples t-test, we're using paired samples, either two scores for each individual or individuals that are matched or paired in some way. Population two, the comparison distribution, um, so in the z-test, the mean is known, mu for the population is given in the problem, and that same is true for the one sample t-test. In the paired samples t-test, we consider that mu will always be zero because we assume no difference. Um, there's been no change in this hypothetical comparison distribution. And the standard deviation is known in the z-test, sigma is given in the problem. In the one sample t-test, it's unknown, and the standard deviation is estimated from the sample and represented by this SM. And that same is true in the paired samples t-test. So when you go through your first practice, you'll be doing a lot of determining which test to use, and you can look for these things as you're making your decision. All right, you are ready to continue on.